Amen. If y'all would open your Bible to Ephesians 6. And as you're turning there, I want to highlight a couple of resources for you. This first book is called Shepherding a Child's Heart. Shepherding a Child's Heart. It's by a guy named Ted Tripp. I don't know when we got this book, not this copy of this book, but this book. It's been over 20 years or something. And uh, the title alone ought to jar something in, in our minds. Shepherding a Child's Heart, not Monitoring a Child's Behavior, first and foremost. This is uh, Ted Tripp, Shepherding a Child's Heart. Next one is uh, Parenting in the Age of Opportunity. Age of Opportunity. This is by Paul Tripp. Many of you are familiar with New Morning Mercies. It's a daily devotional that's gone around our church for quite a while now, and many people have been blessed and benefited from that. Same author here. This book, The Age of Opportunity, is specifically a, a book specifically about parenting teenagers, and I found this one to be very good as well. We have several, several copies of these in the Connect Room, and I don't want any of them to be here. I want you to take one if you don't have one. Um, they have, you, you'll see uh, dollar amounts marked on those. those what, that's what they were paid for, and you can make a donation to that if you would like to, but don't let that stop you from getting one of those. Um, and I should say, um, Paul Tripp uh, is, has been a, a great parenting resource to myself, and, and much of what I'm going to talk to you about today, um, I've taken from him. Unless it's not good, then you know it's from me or something, but uh, his, his stuff is really good. Uh, so our communities... Um, and, and I say that, I mean Gunner and, and our surrounding communities that our church is comprised of, uh, we have a very natural way of uh, emphasizing the, the uh, children. Our, our church loves children. Um, we, our, our communities are, are based around children. If you take really the, the, the school systems and things and, and uh, all the activities of the kids out of the community, can you imagine what that would even, what that would even look like? Um, so I say that because I don't want to let any, no, nobody gets off the hook here. Nobody, if you're sitting here and you're like, I don't have kids and my kids are already raised or I'm, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in a different season or whatever. Uh, if you are um, a part of, of the culture that you and I live in, then you have a role in this. So, and, and as, I, as I talk about parents and I'll say, I'll say parenting very often, um, you have a role in this if you are a youth leader, if you are a teacher, if you are a coach, if you are in some way, um, intentionally uh, mentoring kids, and if you're not intentionally mentoring you, m mentoring them, you're going to find out today. Is one of the things we'll discuss is that they're watching you anyway. So this is this is for for all of us. It's in the Bible, as uh, uh, Wendy read for us, that the children are heritage from the war, from the Lord, a fruit of the womb, a reward. This great gift that we have that God has given us to to steward. So, pastor and author Paul Tripp says, good parenting lives at the intersection of a humble admission of personal powerlessness and a confident rest in the power and grace of God. Good parenting lives at the intersection of a humble admission of personal powerlessness and a confident rest in the power of God and uh, power and grace of God. Very shortly said, good parenting starts with realizing we can't do it and realizing that God can. And then, and that's where we that's where we get started. That we cannot do this on our own. I read this past week in a statement from Jesus where he said, "I cannot do anything apart from the Father." And it just made me think about how, if someone said so, you hear someone say, "I can't do anything without the help," oh, that's not kind of, oh man, how weak is that? You can't do anything. Well, that's if Jesus said that. Uh, we how much more should we need to say that? That we, in order to parent, we need our parent. We need our Heavenly Father. In Ephesians 6, verse 1, I just want to highlight six words from verses 1 through 4. It says in, in, in verse 1, Children, obey your parents. And here's three of the words. In the Lord. If you're like me, and I hope you're not, you might miss that. And you might just look for, what, do I'm, what am I supposed to do? Tell me what it is I'm supposed to do. And I want to do, I want, I want, give me some tasks to, to complete. But if you miss this, if you and I miss this, we're, 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 we're done before we start. That this, all of parenting, as God to be done, happens in the Lord. And then the last three words that, that Wendy read for us earlier in verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in, up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. So there's our six words. In the Lord and of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. Parenting is distinctly Christ-centered and Christ-dependent. 
It's something that we are. A Christian parent is something that we are far and away and long before it is anything that we do. Christian parenting isn't just training our kids how to act good for God. So if you're in that category of, of emphasizing, if that's our, our only point of emphasis, act good for God because he's always watching, then you are uh, conveniently in the category of every other major religion of the world. Every, every major religion has a, a version of that. If you are Hindu, if you are Muslim, if you are Buddhist, whatever, that you, want, you have a moral code and then you want your generation to act good for whatever version of God that they may choose to believe in. Christian parenting is not just training our kids to act good for God. It's knowing God and making him known to our kids. Christian parenting is joining God in what he's doing with our children. More importantly, or more appropriately, with his children that he's entrusted to us. It's contributing and cooperating and relying not on what we can do ourselves, but on the Lord Jesus. Christian parenting is beholding Jesus in such a way that our kids can know him through us, Christ in us, to them. It is learning to make a constant practice of referring everything back to him. And I'm not talking about the way we talk to our kids and say, oh, that's, that's about Jesus, that's about Jesus, that's about Jesus. I'm talking about what's going on in the heart of a, of a follower of Jesus. To constantly, for us to make a reference point back to the Savior. Drawing from his patience that you don't have, and I don't have. Uh, drawing from his wisdom that, that we don't, I, I don't have all the answers. Taking, taking from he, he, the power that he has. I'm powerless to, to do this. L- learning, me as a, as a son, you as a son or daughter, learning from his love and his provision toward us, abiding and getting your nourishment from Jesus Christ in such a way, embracing the fact that God alone pro- provides the means and message for us to be a vessel <clears throat> then to our kids. So um, this is a short series, God, Marriage, and Family. And what I wanted to do was do a sermon on, on uh, parenting. And, I, but I'm, and I'm going to, but I'm going to do a couple. Because I, I think what you want, or again, maybe just say what I want. <clears throat> I want some tips. I want some hacks. And I want some priorities. And I want some goals. And then I'm going to go out and I'm going to shoot for those things. Uh, here's the problem. Um, none of those things. So... None of those things are going to last, really. If I give you all, all the things that you click on Facebook today that have five tips to do whatever, you're very likely going to forget them by the end of the day when you, you know, click on a cat meme or something else next. It felt good for the moment, and you felt like a, par- a better parent because you read it or whatever, but it was momentary, and most likely all of those, just those tips alone, there's nothing wrong. I'm still going to, I'm still going to get to those very practical things next week, so let me run them down. But disconnected from, from something lasting in, in Jesus Christ um, it just go away really fast. Here's another thing that can happen. Let's say it didn't go away really fast. Let's say you got the tips, you got the hacks, you got the list, and then you get the list, and you start killing that list, and you do the list every day. Now what happens in us? If I feel like I have accomplished this list, and it's not connected to Christ, then I've got something in me that's very likely to rear its head any time, and it's called pride. And if I am prideful, I cannot represent Jesus Christ to my kids because Jesus in no way exhibited any sort of pride. So we, y'all, with our thing, this whole thing is becoming about becoming more dependent upon Jesus Christ, specifically in, in regards to how we parent. And we cannot afford to get this wrong. I'll try not to talk long about this, but... Um, God has given us, this is a weird way to say it, but God has given us a wonderful and, and dreadful responsibility as parents. Uh, I love, I love being a dad. I've always loved being a dad. Uh, my wife and I love being parents. We have six kids of our own, and we have uh, fostered uh, multiple other kids, and officially and unofficially. I've got a, I've got a picture of them. So our, uh, just so you get an idea here of how old, how, what the span of this is, my oldest is 25, that's, that's Q, and then our youngest is going to be two uh, soon. And so we've been at this for o- over a quarter of a century. 
And I'm telling you from day one, Casey can attest to this, it was, we were pretty young, we had kids, so it was like every night was a sleepover. You know, like, what's he going to do tonight? What are we going to do? And hey, you know, let's have him watch Lonesome Dove. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, we were just like, what happens if we, you know, like, let's just in every, so uh, a lot of attention, a lot of embracing and, and loving what it means to be a parent. But having done this for over 25 years, I can tell you that it, it, it feels it feels less like I know what I'm doing than ever because I'm looking at it more and more soberly as, as years go by. And it feels more and more like I, have, I need a, a deeper dependence upon God and a less dependence upon my own abilities. This weight of responsibility is not just about me and my version of success. It's about, it's about their hearts being formed. It's about their habits being formed. It's about their future being formed. And our country and our culture being formed. So I I tip my hand a little bit. You know, the future, I believe the future of our culture is not in the hands of politicians, but it's in the hands of parents. Parents whose hands need to be in the hands of God. And and I say that, I know I'm an election year and everything else, but you, you cannot... No matter who you vote, and vote for sure, but no matter who you vote in, you can never legislate a changed heart. That is not going to happen. But we, as parents, have been given the great privilege and the great responsibility of being able to form hearts by God's grace. I believe that um, culture, uh, politics are downstream of, of culture and culture is formed and I believe what you see in the White House is, uh, is because of things that have happened in your house and my house and houses and that later on those things will show up there so if you really, if you really want to, if you and I really want to change and I believe you do, I think you want to see things change you got to start that in your own house you and know, I got to do some things under our own roof and the things that we need to do begin with our abiding in the Lord Jesus the other night I was putting together something from Ikea, because my wife hates me. That's why I was doing that. Um, they, it, they, they ship you something, and it's, a, it's supposed to be furniture, and it's in a flat box. It doesn't even make any sense. You're looking at this going, what, what, what is this? This could hold four pizzas. There's not even anything in here, and it's supposed to be a piece of furniture. So we'll get this stuff out. We start um, spreading out the parts. I've got, I've got my four-year-old there with me and he is um, man he's at first he's like can I just watch something on your phone he's like what are, you know and and uh, he's bored and he doesn't he doesn't like what's going on and and he's like I just want to build something I was like let's, let's build something so you know just by way of confession I did give him the box cutter and let him cut some stuff open nobody got hurt y'all calm down don't you know no need to report anyone and so he he's he's enjoying that and then we get to the part where we're, we're getting the parts out and because there's one million Okay, there's exactly one million he can work on his counting. So it's like, I need these many screw B over here. Give me six of those. He's like, one, two. And I'm telling you all like this, he's a wild man. Like he's just wild bound. He'll be in here after the service in just a little while. I'll have to take him down from the pole. Like he's just, he's everywhere all the time. And all of a sudden he's just locked in. He's just locked in and he's, and he's counting stuff out to me and he's giving it to me. And, and he's watching me put, put the screws in and watching this thing form. And in just a quiet moment when I'm sitting there working this, this screwdriver, uh, he says, Daddy, I just like watching you. I just like watching you. And I said, uh, well, I like having your help, buddy. And we just kept going. Now, why did he say that? Why did he say I like watching you? The reason he said he likes watching me is because he's not old enough yet for his insecurities to set in to stop him from saying what's really on his mind and what he really means. And the reason he said he likes watching me is because he likes watching me. It's in him to watch me and do whatever I do. Parents, your kids, um, I I mean, that may be the last time I hear that. It may settle in at age five. I don't know, but I'm probably not going to hear that very much more. You don't have to hear it. You need to know it. If you need to hear it, hear it from me. They are watching they are watching you. Who are you watching? Who are you watching that would make you fit to have them watch you? Who are we abiding in? Uh, so he likes to watch me. You know what else he likes to do? He's picked up on saying the word dang. So you just be like, would you just give me some dang milk? 
That's what he'll say. Just give me some dang milk. Now, where do you think you picked up on that from? The other day called somebody a dang moron. Some, one, of the, one of the kids said, or it was Casey. Where'd you learn that? I said, don't answer that, son. It's just, <laughs> keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and why does he know that? Because he's watching me. He's watching everything that I'm doing. And they're watching everything that we're doing. Uh, on, so all of these moments, every moment, moment by moment, again, the weight of responsibility, um, these are moments of ministry. These are moments for us to be able to represent the Lord in our life to them. But unfortunately, many times, the moments of ministry have turned into moments of me. To where we as parents make too much about us. We take things way too personal because we've made it about us. And some of us are worshiping our kids as if they are God. All right? And I know no one is like going to set up an, a, a pedestal and put their kid on it and get out and round about it and sing songs. Not yet anyway. But if you look up and everything in your life is surrounding this child and this child being all, all of your attention is given to them to try to get something from them, you're expressing their worth in your life and you can be worshiping them. And worshiping our kids is God giving them everything that they want to make sure that they still like us. It isn't Christian and it isn't parenting. Nor is withholding love from a child when they have hurt our feelings. That isn't Christian and it isn't parenting. And losing it on a child and yelling like a tyrant or grabbing a child by the arm and to jerk them down the hallway to their room isn't Christian and it isn't parenting. Screaming at them at a sporting event and embarrassing them in front of their friends and yours and everyone else at something that was supposed to be enjoyable for them. It isn't Christian and it isn't parenting. Finding out that the responsibility of parenting in adulthood is hard and deciding to instead act like a spoiled child by being absent or inebriated isn't Christian or parenting. Failing to model what loving authority looks like because every child, one of the first things that we need to do is teach our kids what a loving authority looks like. And failing to do that isn't Christian and it isn't parenting and it is keeping our prisons populated. I know that sounds extreme, but that is, that is, a, that is the truth. Because we are the ones who get to represent God to him and God is in authority over our lives. That's why it says, remember he's in the Lord. The Lord, Lord over. Lord, that has programmed into it. He is over us, over us as parents. And none of these things and many others are going to be remedied by a new habit or a new hack. We need a new heart in parenting. So our kids, parents, our kids are not making us angry. And our kids aren't making us impatient. And our kids aren't making us crazy. And our kids aren't making us say hateful things. Our kids aren't forming these things in us. They're just revealing what's already in our hearts. When actually, we're the ones who should be making and molding and shaping their young hearts and minds, not the other way around. So we don't need, parents, we don't need better kids. We don't just need to do better. We actually need to be. It starts 